This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. And InVision. Find out why so many hot startups are using InVision to prototype, present, and collaborate on design in real time. Sign up for a 90-day free trial at envisionapp.com forward slash twist. Hey, everybody. Today on the program, Matthew Marcus of Pembient is on, and he is making, I kid you not, artificial rhinoceros horns. Why? Well, because they can. Because synthetic biology is getting so advanced that we can make a rhinoceros horn in a laboratory so that the people who want to use rhinoceros horns in different tribal medical reasons and, and drink it and do these weird things. I don't mean to be judgmental here, but it's a little bit weird to kill a rhinoceros, to grind up its horn, to drink it. Well, they're making these ones in a laboratory to sell to those people and to keep them from killing rhinoceros, which are quickly becoming uh, endangered. And so we have a real long talk about synthetic biology and where it's going to be in the next 5, 10, 20 years. This actually makes an uh, awesome bookend to the Cambrian genomics talk I had with Austin Hines uh, just over a year ago before his tragic suicide. And the space of synthetic biology is moving very quickly. And where it ends up in the next 5 to 10 years is going to be truly inspiring. And it's also very scary. We don't know exactly where this technology is going to lead us. But it's going to be very exciting and very important for us to all pay attention to synthetic biology. And we'll start today on This Week in Startups with this important discussion. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and this is a show where we talk about the future as conceived by technologists and entrepreneurs. The world is changing very quickly. We live in a time of tremendous change. Sometimes change is a little bit scary. Things are changing. We're not sure if it's for the better or the worse. But you know what? There's a lot of interesting projects going on in the field of biology. Synthetic biology, they call it. I'm a neophyte, as probably are you in this field. This is one of those spaces that we're going to explore a little more on This Week in Startups as we go into 2016. I'm going to challenge myself and the audience to understand something like synthetic biology and artificial intelligence, some of the more heady topics that are coming around uh, in the internet. Listen, we all understand how apps work and on-demand and SaaS and enterprise software. This stuff is easy. It's de rigueur. That's French for ordinary. I'm using some fancy words on the show. It's like uh, deja vu all over again, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, and today on the program, I have Matthew Marcus, who is the co-founder and CEO of Pembient. Welcome to the program, Matthew. Thank you, Jason. What is Pembient? Um, so Pembient, in a nutshell, is a, it's a synthetic biology startup. Okay. It's basically using the tools of synthetic biology to create rhinoceros horn. Okay. Now, you, the tools of synthetic biology... And I was waiting for you to say to create androids that could do our bidding like the Nexus 6 in Blade Runner or something. Mm -hmm. But instead, your startup, I think if I heard you correctly, is making rhinoceros horns. Yeah, it's a little bit of back to the future, I guess. Okay, explain to me why Pembient uh, and you and your co-founders decided to do this. Why go after the rhinoceros horn? Explain. Sure. Uh, so uh, the rhinoceros horn is used in East Asia as a luxury product, and it also uh, has this... Uh, folk medicine beliefs attached to it. And so uh, over time, the rhinoceros has become an endangered species, uh, but these beliefs have persisted. And so now rhinoceros horn on the black market trades about $65,000 per kilogram, making it one of the most ex expensive substances on earth. $65,000 per kilogram. That's correct. What's a kilogram? Is it a couple ounces or an ounce? Uh, no, it's a little bit more than that. Yeah, ah. it's, it's roughly, it's, it's like a pound. A pound. Yeah, yeah. It's so a pound is 65000 uh, yeah, basically. Yeah. Last time you bought a pound of cocaine, Matthew, what, what did that cost you? Uh, it was less. <laughs> it was less. I think the pound, what is it? I mean, uh, this is, I mean, a pound of gold is less. It's more than gold. Yes. Yeah. Right? An ounce of gold is $1,000, 16 like ounces that. in yeah. a pound, yeah, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. 
And this is Asian people, Chinese people, believe well, it, Korean it, people, what? So, I mean, basically, it's like, I would say like frankincense and myrrh, maybe in the West or something like that. It's, it. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a substance that's steeped in history. Got um, it. And it, it had b the belief uh, or its value was in, in Japan and China and Taiwan and uh -huh. Korea for a while. And uh, as the middle classes have emerged in China and, and, and Vietnam now, uh, they're more into it than maybe Taiwanese and Japanese Is and it a were... uh, aphrodisiac type thing? Is that what they look at it for sexual prowess or for fertility? Um, that's kind of like a Western myth that oh, was kind of back, okay. back propped or back fed back into okay. East Asia. Um, so what do they believe a rhinoceros horn powder does for them? Sure. Well, in, a, in the powdered form, uh, it was used in traditional Chinese medicine. And you could think of it sort of as, uh, well, they, we could call it a cooling agent. I'm not a complete expert on traditional yeah. Chinese medicine, but the analogy would be a fever reducer. Got uh, it. Yeah. You, is there any scientific basis for this, or it's just nonsense? Uh, so there's not actually much research in reality. Um, sure. pe people have looked at some of the components and say there's nothing there, but then there was a randomized controlled trial done in Taiwan in 1993 that did show a statistically significant effect of fever reduction in children, and that was the only human trial really conducted. So, uh, and there's some caveats to that, obviously, like yeah. acetaminophen performed better, <laughs> or Tylenol. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, but so we don't have to chop off our nose. No, we don't. No, we we don't. go to Walgreens and yeah. get... Acetaminophen, yes, you, you should be fine. Tylenol yeah. mm -hmm. will do better. Okay, so you see this incredible injustice and horrific, you know, let's call it 1,000-year-old or 2,000-year-old tradition is going to basically result in all rhinos being wiped out. Uh, well, yeah, the rhino populations have been slowly decimated over time for a variety of reasons, and now uh, this is maybe the last, uh, you know, sort of gasp, to potentially. I mean, there's only about 20,000 to 30,000 rhinos left in the world today. Is that right? Yeah. Wow, that is unbelievable. I didn't realize it was that low. Because mm -hmm. you see rhinos in every zoo you go to, right? Like, there's, they're pretty populous. Why are they so populous in zoos, do you think, that we see them in all those places? Are they easy to breed in captivity? Actually, they are, well, somewhat easy to, yeah. to manage. Um, you, I mean, we can get into farming of them later. People have suggested farming them yeah. as a way of getting around this problem. But um, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So let, 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 let them create rhinoceros farms in China to get their horns instead of taking them out of the wild. Yeah, or in South Africa. But you had a better idea. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your idea. Um, so, so basically, uh, there's, there's some drawbacks potentially farming the animals. Um, you can farm them. Uh, you may have to tranquilize them. The horn does grow back after you saw it off. Uh, but um, the demand is such that people are fearful that if you did start farming them, the demand would increase faster than you could farm the animals. Uh. And so uh, technology, obviously, one nice thing about technology is it scales. And so that's really what kind of the first sort of impetus that drove us towards looking at this is because if you could do this in bioreactors, if you could do this in a lab, um, you could do it at scale potentially. Got it. So you have in front of you what looks like a little peanut butter in a dish. Oh, uh, yeah. What are we looking at here? I'm so, assuming it's not, I had a taste before. It didn't taste anything like yeah, peanut butter. No, I was going to let you have a taste, yeah. Um, this, I'm kidding. Uh, I didn't taste it. Did, yeah. You can have a taste if you want. Um, okay. I've tasted it. Um, this, uh, let's go in order, I guess, yeah. and we'll, we'll start here, because this is what we started with ourselves. And this, okay. this was a powder um, that we formulated um, maybe in 2014 now, in the, in the summer months then. Um, it has uh, spectrographic and genetic uh, similarities to rhinoceros horn. Okay. And we took this powder to Vietnam, and we did some customer development and market research there on this powder. Um, kind of what we found out, though, is that people, powders are relatively easy to fake, uh, you know, people uh, would prefer larger objects. And so we've then started working on, and this is a, a crude sort of 3D printed uh, horn like uh, piece um, that we did uh, in January of this year. And we've been working now to basically construct larger pieces of these, uh, these sort of uh, cultured horn products. So this will be faux rhinoceros horns, but literally on a, on a chemical basis, how close are they to the actual real thing? Sure, yeah. We Identical like to, or? Yeah, we like to call them cultured. Um, and so what we have is sort of an iterative process where we um, source a lot of the biomaterials that go into the horn and then formulate a horn out of those biomaterials. And then we go back and we basically make those sourced ingredients closer and closer to what you'd find in an actual rhinoceros. And this iterative approach over time gets you something that's closer and closer to being uh, something that's uh, bioidentical to rhinoceros horn. What is your goal here? Is your goal to create enough of these that the demand will buy yours for a cheaper price and stop killing rhinos? Or is this a market opportunity where, hey, it's going for $65,000 a pound, we can do it for 
$6,000 a pound and you'll get twice as much and for half the price or a third of the mm -hmm. price. Like, is this a market opportunity for you? It's, well, we have a dual mandate, obviously, as a company. We have a profit motive, uh, but we also have, uh, so we want to maximize profit, but at the same time, minimize poaching. So right. that sort of makes us almost like a public benefit corporation, though we're not set up like that right now, uh, where we have these dueling mandates. Uh, and, um, you know, yeah, I mean, the nice thing about the product is that it, on the black market, it is so expensive, and that gives you room to actually do the science, um, engineer something that's cheaper, and still have a very high margin. So with the science... If you were to figure out what the active ingredient is in a rhino horn or what people perceive to be the active ingredient, we don't know if it is, you could make a more dense or more deeply structured version of it. I don't know what the right word, more potent, I guess. Is that possible where you could say like, hey, the potency of this is three times or 10 times greater than that of an actual rhino horn. Therefore, this is better. Sure. Um, I think... A lot, a lot of times in these beliefs, it's more holistic than mm. active ingredient based. And so we went, they create something that's a holistic uh, representation of, 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 of what uh, people desire. And that's what we're going for right now. I mean, you, what, one thing we are looking at, though, is purity. Um, we have the potential ah. to make something pure in a lab. And so we have this concept ah. of the, the rhinos in, in the wild today are almost like a fallen rhinos. There was uh, you know, nuclear testing in the South Pacific that drifted around to Cougar National Park. There's pollution out there. There's pesticides in use, right. mining. So the rhinos in the park today are not really the rhinos of 1,000 years ago when the tradition started. The rhinos of today are sort of a fallen rhino. And so we can go in a lab, potentially, and roll back and create a horn that's more like the horn of a rhino from 1,000 years ago than the horn ah, of today. So then you'd have the high ground. Mm -hmm. But in a way, what you're doing is like making a synthetic Jesus for people who believe that Jesus was a superhero who came back from the dead. Like, you're basically building a solution for people who believe in something that is an actual science. Um, well, there's... First of all, it has... Like, a, you don't believe this belief system. No, well, I don't, I don't think the belief, the, the belief system is kind of secondary to the, 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 the durable goods or luxury market. So, ah. I mean, there, there are physical objects carved out of these horns, libation cups, jewelry. Oh, I see. Uh, and, and then the, the shavings or whatever actually end up in the folk belief uh, system. And Got so it. Oh, there's, so there's another market, which the, is cups. Yeah, there's well, cups of jewelry, beads, um, ah. combs. These are these are these are things. It's almost like ivory. It's a similar kind of carving substance, and you can produce things of great of great beauty and value, um, you know, carving on on the horn. Interesting. Yeah. So it's actually like there's two uses. There's like two uses, and the and the the, the scraps are kind of like fed off to the folk belief system. Got and, it. Yeah. Which is the bigger market, the folk belief system for powders or the actual making of dishes? And is that like a dish there that was made out of it? The, this goes back. This goes more to the folk belief uh, system here. Is basically this is a, a horn grinding dish I got in Vietnam about four weeks ago, and so basically it they, you would take a, a scrap of horn and with water or, or or a spirit or something like that, grind that and create like your own tonic, and then you mm. drink uh, the tonic. Right. Yeah. Amazing. All right. When we get back from commercial break, I want you to teach me how this is actually done. Sure. Educate me. Give me a quick PhD if you can in like 10 minutes when we get back on This Week in Startups. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Let me stop for a moment this amazing episode and tell you about the Walker Corporate Law Group. Yes, they are a boutique law firm that specializes in the representation of entrepreneurs and startups. And Scott Walker is the founder of that company, and he is a personal friend of mine, and he does a great job working with startups. I have literally introduced him to dozens, maybe hundreds now, of startups, and they all rave about the services of the Walker Corporate Law Group because their lawyers have decades of experience. You're not going to get junior associates who are getting on-the-job training with your startup. No. They're going to help you with mergers and acquisitions, licensing, terms of service, privacy policies, formation, all this kind of stuff, fundraising, and they're really great at it. And they do fixed fees. They don't want to surprise people with crazy, crazy bills. They think that billable hours can reward inefficiency. So they'll just be fair with you. And that's what I love about them. Because if you're a startup, you don't want to get that sticker shock and get a huge, huge bill, make sure you use the Walker Corporate Law Group. And you can do that by calling Scott Walker at 415-979-9998. 415-979-9998. You can email him, scott at walkercorporatelaw.com. Or you can visit Walker Corporate Law dot com as well. Scott at WalkerCorporateLaw.com and let Scott Ed Walker on Twitter know, at Scott Ed Walker, know that you, hey, you watch the program and you appreciate him supporting independent media like This Week in Startups. One of my oldest advertisers, one of my oldest friends in the industry, just a great guy, a total mensch, and he really takes care of the startups who work with him. 
Thank you, Scott Walker, for supporting This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Jason. And you can follow the show at TWI Startups, as in This Week in Startups, at TWI Startups, both on Twitter and on Instagram, where the kids are hanging out these days. My guest today is Matthew Marcus. You can follow Matthew on the Twitter, Matthew Marcus. What do you think of the new heart instead of the star, Matthew? Uh, I just saw that briefly. I don't know. I can't it's kind of crushing. <laughs> it's kind of crushing, isn't it? Yes. Well, I can't make up my mind. I need to, more time to... You really have to really consider your consider statement it. on this. Yes, right. I agree. I've already made my statement on Twitter. My official statement is I use the star in order to bookmark or recognize the existence of a tweet. Mm-hmm. But a heart is way too intimate. Like I might, There's times I might love what you're doing um, with Pembient, but... <laughs> There were times you might like tweet, like I went to see The Martian. I mean, not like hard it. I might just want to recognize it. Do you say, you know, like now it's like I have to, it's a real full it's a endorsement. Big commitment. Yeah. See, it's more commitment than <laughs> I'm really actually ready to do. This is what turned me off to Facebook. Like, I don't want to like all your stuff. Yeah. I may not like it. I may recognize it, but. All right. So you are building this um, from the bottom up rhinoceros horn. And, oh, and by the way, it's worth noting that you're part of Indie Bio. That's correct, yeah. Which is the world's first synthetic bio accelerator. Mm-hmm. Now, synthetic biology, um, what is synthetic biology? I mean, I can tell from the word it's fake biological material. Synthetic, right, would be fake or manufactured. Yeah. I mean, fake's a little offensive. It's okay. a little, it's a, yeah. Synthetic it's is a, probably a horrible word. I mean, I think everybody would like to get away from that. Oh, they would, actually. Is that yeah. like a thing in the industry? Well, uh, Well, especially for... People looking at, well, in our, the, this little subsector we work in has been kind of termed the animal replacement industry. Animal replacement? Industry, yes. Oh, that's, that's yeah. much more kind. And yes, by Scott Bannister, of all people. So, um, and, uh, you know, in that industry, synthetic is a really horrible word because it connotates plastic or fake. Or fake. Yeah, yeah. You so, know, it's like reminds you of Blade Runner when they're like, is this snake real and is this owl real? And it's like, who could ever afford a real owl or a real snake mm-hmm. in yeah. do androids dream of electric sheep? Yeah. It's your favorite short story? It's not my favorite, but... It's up there? Yeah. <laughs> but you don't choose the... So anyway, synthet- what's another way to talk about just synthetic biology? Does that the industry have a new term? Well, for within the food domain that synthetic biology has been applied to, um, uh-huh. a cultured is the word that comes up a oh, lot. Oh, cultured. Because you're using usually yeast or some sure. microorganism to produce proteins, and it's similar to brewing beer um, or you know making cheese or something like that, except you know using a little more high-tech... Uh, modifications of those organisms. So it's still a, a culturing sort of process. Um, okay, so this Indie Bio Accelerator that's here in San Francisco, mm-hmm. this is the first time, this the first class you're going through? Uh, so the first, first cohort? Yeah, we, we've, the first cohort finished technically in June, and so okay. there's already a second cohort running, actually maybe two blocks from here. In okay, the lab. Yeah. in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And you are, uh, you were part of the first. That's correct. So how many companies were in there? Were you all just like making little weird Biology projects? Yeah, so I think there's about 12 companies that were in it. Um, and basically, they, they, in the, they, they, Indie Bio stands for independent biology. And so they've tried to basically bias towards things that maybe are outside of human health and therapeutics, like projects that may be tangential to that. I mean, sometimes a therapeutics slips in or a diagnostic slips in, but there's you know a lot of things we're looking at basically. Um, like one of the companies, Clara Foods, is like brewing egg whites uh, in yeast. So basically, it's, oh. a, it's a chickenless egg product. Um, much, you know, kind of like the next generation of Hampton Creek in some regards. Right. Instead of using plant proteins, you're just getting the animal proteins, but you're getting them directly from yeast. No chickens involved. Okay. Now, this is where all of a sudden my understanding it gets weak. Mm-hmm. I found my weak chain. So I understand you have plant proteins. You take the plant proteins, soy-based proteins, whatever, and you make them egg-like. Mm-hmm. But what you're saying is you create the animal proteins. Mm-hmm. So no animals are going into the making of those eggs or the rhino. Mm-hmm. What is the source material for the rhino horn or for the eggs? Sure. So th- this is where uh, you know computer science comes into play, or the intersection of computer science and, and biology is that now you can basically you know using databases look up um, codes for you know genes basically, get those gene sequences and actually go from a computer file to a mo- molecule. That molecule can then be pushed inside of a, an organism like yeast or E. coli, and that would then become like a mini factory to produce that particular substance. Got it. So, so you have the yeast, mm-hmm. which exists in nature. Mm-hmm. And where do you get yeast from? Is yeast like 
where is the, where's the source material of yeast? Uh, that's a good question. Well, there, there, there are providers that, like, basically you, you, you buy from, you know, biology um, suppliers. Right suppliers, yeah. And so there's different forms of yeast. Yeah, different strains. Or, yeah. Then you take a little genetic code mm -hmm. and you sequence it on a molecule. The molecule is made out of what? Oh, so so you, you would go from a digital potential, you, 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 it's almost like a, like CAD design or something like that. So you'd stick all these, you'd have all, all this in a computer, you'd stick all these genes and promoters and whatnot together to create sort of like a circuit or something like that. Mm -hmm. That would then be synthesized into DNA. Okay. And that DNA would be inserted into the organism. Got it. Organism so what is that DNA? The DNA is when you actually make it, is it just a piece of liquid? Is it... Uh, a molecule. What is it exactly? Well, yeah, it's 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 uh, DNA is a molecule, right? And, and basically, at, and, and you know, you basically would create a lot of it uh, potentially, and that would basically then be uh, transfected into the yeast through different processes. What does that mean, transfected? Well, I mean, there's different inserted? ways. Inserted? Yeah, inserted. There's different ways to get the the, the 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 molecules into the yeast. You can like shock them, and sometimes the membrane will break, and the stuff will drift ah. in there, and then they'll heal it up. And so I'm not I'm not. I'm more of a dry biologist and a wet yeah. biologist, so I don't Got really work at the bench top, but yeah. But so that is the, the process that's going on right now that's enabled all of this. And Craig Ventner and all these guys doing the genome projects and the sequencing, all that's the technology that has now become super cheap to do all this? Yeah, so since, since the, I mean, so sequencing, obviously DNA sequencing has been around for a while. Yep. It's like a billion dollars. A while being like 20 years. Yeah, 20 years, yeah. I mean, you get the human genome done, maybe in you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, it was like a billion dollars or more. Um, now, you know, you're getting down to like, you know, $1,000 per genome. So that's right. a huge drop in, in cost. And then synthesis, which is going, so that's reading. Right. Now writing would be the other, you know, the other operation, if you look at from a pure science standpoint. So writing DNA is now dropping in costs too. And so when you have reading and writing, now you're starting to become more of an engineering discipline where you can right. start doing things uh, in a more uh, precise way. And what do you think of Cambrian genom Genomics? This mm -hmm. was a company, Austin Hines, who yeah. tragically killed himself uh, last year, and he was on the program. Mm -hmm. was, there were people who thought that company was, you know, there was nothing there. And then some people thought, oh, this is like, because I saw his equipment for printing. It's mm -hmm. a very similar process, right? So, yeah, he was doing, Austin, I mean, I, I had great respect for Austin. He yeah. was a brilliant, brilliant person. Uh, and unfortunately, he did uh, commit suicide. Um, so, but he basically uh, was building a technology for writing DNA. Right. And one of the problems is with writing DNA is that you, it was okay, to, it was easy to sort of get short strands of DNA. But to get longer strands, you couldn't really do that. And mm -hmm. obviously, to build more complex things, you want to be able to write more. And so his technology was basically a, a way of kind of gluing those small pieces together to create larger strands cheaply. Got and, it. Uh, and it was, it, it, you know, it, it was something. Oh, there's other companies doing it, of course, not just not just Cambrian. But um, right. he was in an arms race to to conquer that market. Is that been conquered yet? And is Cambrian still working on that? Or my understanding is Cambrian is not around Defunct. anymore. Yeah, um, but. Um, but there are like the, um, is it Gen 9, I believe? There's another company that, that does this. And, and they all have different kind of underlying technologies, but they're all trying to do the same exact thing, which is print larger and larger strands of, of DNA. And larger printed strands of DNA will let you do more complex organisms? Well, it lets you do more complex engineering uh -huh. and, 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 and obviously quicker, too. I mean, uh, and and people like Craig Venter and stuff, they're trying to build like, you know, synthetic genomes where it's not just you know, you have a, a few, like a small switch or a small sort of setup where you have a protein and a promoter and you're trying to, uh, or, I mean, a gene and a promoter and you're trying to create a protein. They want to create more complex, almost like living organisms that do mm. a lot of different things at the same time and, and, and do it de novo from scratch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how long have you been working on this horn? How many months? And how much progress have you made and using that as a proxy for will, where you will be in the future, give us an idea of the arc of history right now in synthetic biology. Sure. So, I mean, we started the project in early 2014. And one thing we liked about the synthetic biology approach as opposed to maybe the tissue engineering approach, because that's another sort of technology you could use, you know, using stem cells and things like that. Mm. Um, we felt that the synthetic biology approach would work would, would, quicker to get us prototypes, and it did. So we were able to basically, um, you know, construct some prototypes. Uh, so there's kind of like two parts to a startup like this, like Clara Foods or us. Um, there's a formulation approach where you try to 
using the you know, constituent molecules create the object itself, but you may source them from all over the place. You don't know care. You're just trying to see if, could we put Humpty Dumpty back together again? And then there's this other approach, which is basically swapping out those molecules, like I said earlier, with maybe more exact copies of what might actually be in, in the model organism you're trying to replicate. And so, um, so with the formulation stuff here, um, we were able to make great progress formulating stuff initially from sheep's wool. So that's a keratin. Uh -huh. It's a protein um, that's you know found in rhino horn. It's a, it's a family of proteins actually. It's a structural the um, keratin. The keratin, yeah. yeah. And so what we've done now is we're starting to swap out the keratin we we, we derive from sheep's wool with keratin derived from rhinoceros. But what we're doing is finding the genes, putting those genes inside uh, you know yeast. The yeast will then secrete the proteins. You purify them and then you put them back in and remove the sheep's wool from the process. Got it. So that's just in a year or two. So well, we are now at the step where we're basically. I would say it's called secretion rate analysis. So basically trying to figure out like at what rates do the yeast secrete the proteins mm. because we want to be able to basically scale this up so that they secrete enough. And if, if they don't secrete enough, then you may need a building, you know, a doer the size of the building to ferment the thing in. And you don't, in that case, then you need to go back and figure out like, why is this not working? Can we make the yeast optimize? Can we optimize the yeast in some way to produce more protein so we have a, a smaller form factor? So you haven't figured it out perfectly yet? We have not figured it out perfectly yet. No, You're it's, halfway it's still, there? It's still, it's still biology. Well, Yes, I would say we're halfway there. We, what we, we like to have prototypes all the time, and so it's all just a matter of like continuous development. Uh, we can every day we have a prototype, and every day. When we, will you have like a full horn? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, we uh, are not sure. We've been able to get um, larger than this, and our goal is obviously a full size horn, but a full horn is, I don't Huge. know if you've seen them. I wish I brought up. Uh, it's I, half I mean, the size of a human being. Not quite it's that like big, three, but yeah. two, three feet. Right? Yeah, it's it's, 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 it's bigger than you would think. Yes, I, I think mean, it's twenty four inches. Yeah, it may be. Yes, thirty think, inches. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, Something think, in that yeah, range. yeah. It's it's it's, it's shockingly large. It's like large. a child. We, we have scans of yeah. We've scanned them and we have scans of them and we've printed out like you know just plastic models to get mm -hmm. kind of understand the the form you know how we would form them and stuff like that. And it, they're very large objects. And so so it might take a couple years. It, it could take a while to get to a full sized horn. Yes. Um, and so. How does this all work on like an international basis? Uh, I know with stem cell research, we here in the United States were a little bit uh, banning it, I guess, limiting it back in the day. Um, and now it's a little bit less so. Who's leading the charge in terms of on a global basis synthetic biology? Is it Korea? Is it us? Well, there's stem cells, which I don't, people would maybe not term synthetic biology. Then there's synthetic biology, which is more like the design. So they're, they're, they're close together. They're not maybe right. exactly the same. They're adjacent. Uh, yeah, yeah, adjacent. And um, uh, with the stem cells, I'm not a tissue engineer or stem cell expert, but, you know, things things change where we didn't necessarily have to use embryonic stem cells anymore. Right. And that was the big big moral issue, I think. And yeah. people then, uh, since there were other ways around that moral issue, no, 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 I think we're at pace with the rest, the rest of, the, of the world. world. Yeah. Um, on the other side, with synthetic biology, um, there's a lot of work in Europe uh, in synthetic biology. UK has a very strong um, kind of national program to push that as a as a way forward. Um, there's a thing called iGEM. Um, yes. Yeah, and that, and that's basically an international uh, competition uh, where people come from across the world, teams from colleges, to kind of do these like synthetic biology projects and present them. They're, the iGEM, I think, it just recently completed. I don't know who won actually. I didn't follow up on that, but yeah, it's that's. When we get back from this next commercial break, I want you to tell me what the most impressive synthetic biology projects you've seen other than your own mm -hmm. recently because there's a big conference going on here yes what's that conference called? Uh, so there's synthetic uh syn symbio beta uh, symbio beta is this is a large conference it's probably the biggest synthetic biology conference right. and it's occurring uh, wednesday and thursday perfect so uh here in san francisco i want to know what are the most compelling projects and what the world's going to look like in another 10 years if things continue at this pace when we get back on this week in startups Hey everybody, let me tell you a little bit about Envision app. I use Envision app all the time with my designer, my product manager, my growth team to share mock-ups of our products. We take those mock-ups and we design them and we send them to clients, to partners, to investors. And we say, here is an Envision link. Open this on your iPhone, on your Android phone, and you can click through and see what this product that we're making is like. And when we're building websites, hey, put your comments on there. We have a partner. We have a big Smart Camp thing going on with IBM, Smart Camp 2015. You know, we can use Envision to share that website and say, hey, is there anything you want to change? And then have a threaded discussion. You can take all those discussions off of email, all those discussions out of the chat room. Listen, email and chat rooms have their place, but not in product design. Envision 
is like Slack, but for product design, right? So you have Slack for a general conversation. You have Gmail for you know, asynchronous communication. You have Envision for product excellence. You cannot make a great product without Envision. I am dead serious about that. Every startup I invest in, I show it to them. They ask them to send me links, and boy, does it work. It supercharges everything you do. I love this product. I love this product. I love this product. Get out of email. Get out of chat rooms. And do what Twitter, Airbnb, Evernote, Adobe, and many more are doing. Prototype um, what you're doing in Envision. It just makes designers and teams and founders so, so, so much more efficient. Go to envisionapp.com slash twist for 90 days free. That's their starter plan, free for 90 days, only at envisionapp.com slash twist, envisionapp.com slash twist. And everybody thank Envision App on Twitter. I thank them for making a great product and for supporting independent media like this week in startups. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. And how great is my life? I just want to say that right off the bat. I get to sit here with smart people and get educated every week. Incredible. And you know what? You all get to come along for the ride, y'all. Y'all get to come along for the ride and be part of these interesting conversations twice a week at thisweekinstartups.com. Uh, my guest today, Matthew Marcus, who is with Pembient, pembient.com. What does Pembient mean? Uh, so it's a combination of two words. Uh, pembe is horn or tusk in Swahili, oh. and I-E-N-T is sort of indication of. It's okay. a suffix in, in English, so I just mashed them together. and it Love worked. it. Yeah. It's a great name, and the domain was available. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? Go figure. Uh, well done. Now, you went to this big synthetic biology, or you're going to this big synthetic biology conference here in San Francisco this week. Mm -hmm. What's the name of that conference? Oh, so that conference is called SynBioBeta. SynBioBeta. What, what do you think are the most compelling projects going on in synthetic biology that, you know, we'll experience in the next five to 10 years that we would be impressed by as just consumers? Sure. Uh, I'll constrict myself to the food domain here first and say, um, so there's a nonprofit called New Harvest, and New Harvest basically uh, has spun out some startups using synthetic biology to tackle um, food issues. And one of these startups is Clara Foods, which is the egg startup I mentioned earlier, yeah. brewing egg whites and yeast. Uh, and another one is Moo Free, which is a cow-free uh, startup uh, making milk without the cows. So. so in the near future, not our children's future, but our future, five or ten years from now, we're going to be having eggs that are biologically identical or close to identical mm -hmm. to regular eggs. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming if they're biologically identical, identical, the flavor profile and the taste profile will be pretty close too. That's correct, and in five or ten years, we might be able to buy egg whites that don't have the car that don't have the cruelty that comes from factory farming. Yes, so no cruelty, less water usage, uh, lower carbon footprint. These are all sort of benefits that come from using this technology. Yeah, I um I visited a cow farm recently. I was up in Petaluma, Northern California. It's amazing, by the way. I'm really enjoying living here. But Petaluma up there, they have all these cow farms, and this I went to an organic cow farm, and I thought, wow, this is going to be you know, delightful. They treat the cows really well, but they still have them in pens. And they're like, and here are the, here are the calves. Like, you notice how we put them over here away from their parents so that they don't break their legs. And they're like in the pens across from the moms. And all they're doing is crying yeah. for their moms. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so heartbreaking. It's like literally going to a torture chamber and watching animals be tortured. It's brutal to watch. Mm -hmm. This really could end the suffering and, and really help us Feed the planet. Yeah, in fact, a lot of those founders are vegan. Uh, I'm vegetarian myself, yeah. but um, they have a very strong ethic driving why they're using technology. I mean, they're kind of trying to use technology to make everyone vegan without you know you knowing it. You know, you'll be vegan. It's almost like a vegan takes over the world. <laughs> right. It's so if they made a vegan steak, mm -hmm. look like a steak, taste like a steak, essentially is a steak. Mm -hmm. As a vegan, if you ate that, would you be still vegan? That's a good question. I mean, I think a lot of people, it's a debate, I guess. I mean, a lot of people think that uh, you would still, in fact, be vegan because uh, there's no, I mean, cruelty involved. I mean, if you're doing it for health reasons, maybe maybe not, but uh, if you're doing it what for... What about for you? I mean, you're... Oh, well, I'm a vegetarian. Uh, I if would, I put that big juicy steak in front of you, it's delicious. <laughs> you get put a fried egg on top of it, some Brene <laughs> sauce. All from the lab. Um, All from the lab? Yeah. Uh, what, what happened? You look a little freaked out by that. No, well, no, no. I think... Uh, or, you, or you might be like freaking out because you, you can't wait to have a steak again with uh, <laughs> Brene's on <laughs> it. I yeah, know. I think, well, because I was at Biofabricate, which is another conference uh, in New York. Uh, yeah. It was at, and Modern Meadow was there. Modern Meadow is trying to basically make, uh, you know, a, 
a cultured hamburger product or cultured right. meat product. And they had uh, these chips, uh, beef chips. So they've made these chips already that are, you know, completely made in a laboratory. And they were actually, you know, letting people taste them. Um, I didn't get a taste of it. They're, they're still, like, very expensive per chip, maybe $100 per chip. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but um, you know, but, yeah, but, you know, I mean, people on stage were, you know, vegetarian or vegan. And they, they, they got to have they, steak they, for they, the first time in a long time. Yep, that's right, yeah. So you would have no ethical problem with it? I don't think there's any ethical issue with that, no. I mean, some, why? Yeah, some people may go to an extreme and say an animal had to give the first biopsy, you know, so there's an original sin sort of to the process. That's a but little ridiculous. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that, you know, everybody's got their boundaries. You could just parameters. take the cow that got hit by a car and yes, whatever. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And just take their DNA and mm -hmm. theoretically the person would be off the hook. And, mm -hmm. But now this is going to have a profound impact on the regular delivery of food. You're not going to have to deal with you know, uh, bacteria in food in the same way or shortages of food, it could have a profound impact on how the f whole food system works. Yes, potentially. Um, I think when, when things, be, besides building sort of optimized products like, uh, you know, an egg white that made foam uh, better than uh, a regular egg white, be adjusting the protein concentrations and whatnot. Better souffles. Better souffles. I'm I mean, in. Yeah. There's also, uh, I think, price volatility reduction. So reducing, you know, price volatility, if it, there's not going to be necessarily, your chickens aren't going to die from some sort of viral infection and therefore drive egg ah. prices up, you know, that'll be bounded potentially. And if it's bound to such a degree, there may not be any need for commodities contracts anymore to certain to some, right. some, some degree. It's going to be a crazy world we live in in a very short period of time, isn't it? Yeah. But crazy good in a way. Yeah, good. I mean, these are all good things, I think. What's the futuristic stuff that when you guys are drinking at the bar after the conference, you guys talk about, gals talk about, and say, like, you know, and you got a couple of drinks and you're like, wouldn't it be funny if we did this or that? Like, could you put a rhinoceros horn on a human being eventually? Are you going to be able to inject muscle fibers into people? I mean, how far is this going to go in terms of making super athletes or who knows? Yeah, who knows? I mean, there's... I mean, this synthetic biology stuff is it's kind of open ended, is it not? Yeah, and then there's also CRISPR, which is this new genome editing technique. Whoa, 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 what's that? Uh, so it's it's a it's the ability to basically sort of take a genome and edit pieces of it. Um, Ooh. Yeah, and so you can basically edit. So people have talked about editing maybe out the horn from a rhino. So you'd have hornless rhinos and therefore no poaching. I mean, so it, flip a switch <laughs> yeah. and either add or take out. Yeah, you could you can basically tinker with the genome. You, we didn't really have this ability before to do it in this way uh, to to kind of slice and dice out pieces at will. Um, and, and 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 what is that called again? The technology CRISPR. CRISPR. Yeah, don't ask me what the ac acronym is. It's a horribly long acronym. Um, and CRISPR is not owned by a company. It's a standard. Uh, well, no, it's there's patent issues around it. Oh, uh, really? Uh, there's some conf conflict there. Yeah. So at yeah. some point there'll be the CRISPR 2000 in every home to flip a switch to get <laughs> like slightly different whatever. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you, that, well, you, it's usually done at the germline, but then there's yeah. these things called like gene drives people are talking about too. So basically, with you, you could basically um, engineer like a mosquito. So normally, if you engineer something into an organism, it would it was like you know would say like it, it wasn't optimal for the organism. Uh, the, this trait you engineered engineered into it that then it, that or, the organism wouldn't propagate in the environment and you wouldn't have this trait spread everywhere. But with CRISPR, you can basically program it so basically that trait could actually kind of take over and hijack the the machinery of the organism and actually propagate through. Uh, you know, as the organism reproduces, it instead of being weeded out, wow. it'll, it'll actually kind of. Um, you know, take over. And so you could basically edit things out of mosquitoes and edit, you know, certain certain things out of general populations. So if you got a, a base of mosquitoes, you could say, hey, the ability to carry the Ebola virus or whatever. I think mosquitoes yeah, carry yeah, Ebola. No. What does mosquitoes carry? Uh, malaria. Malaria, rather. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ebola. Yeah. That's, a, that's a, yeah, I think it'd be more mammals, right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, you take malaria. The ability to carry malaria is taken out of a mosquito's ability. I don't know if that's possible or not. Mm -hmm. But then those mosquitoes that then reproduced would then maybe they wouldn't have that trait themselves, but they would pass it on, is what you're saying. Yeah. So basically, yeah, the trait even if it was advantaged advantageous from malaria for mosquitoes to harbor malaria, like you could basically force that out of the, out of the population. Overriding over Darwin. Basically, yes. Yeah. We can override Darwin. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's so juicy. It's basically, you guys are going to be able to make... What about with humans? So if you can start flipping the genome, and pe or pieces of the genome, rather, in the Petri dish, what could you do with a human who's already grown? Are we going to... If you flipped my DNA in my body, it wouldn't do anything, right? Because uh, well, I'm already it's, grown? It's hard to... 
I mean, you have thousands of millions and billions of cells, yes. so, so you're not going to be able to flip really all of them. You can't do it, right? Yeah, 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 it's very hard to redo that. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're I'm already there's, grown. There's gene, there, you know, there's gene, gene therapy techniques that people have tried with, with having viruses, you know, basically retroviruses come in and, 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 and change things. Um, around. Around, but, but yeah, it's not really easy. It's, most of this happens at the germline level, so right. basically you, you engineer something, then when it grows, it, the, every cell has that, that same sort of So profile. there has to be some quantum leap in order for us to be able to flip a switch and have mutant-like powers or reverse aging or reverse hair loss or something. Well, for, yeah, for us, yes, but for future generations, potentially, you know, there, this is a big ethical issue now. Like, would you want to do, like, these kind of germline mu manipulations on, you know, yes. future offspring? And yes. Make them smarter, make them yes. whatever. Yeah. Well, see, there, <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you ask any individual, do you want your children to be smarter? Do you want your children to suffer less? Do you want your children to not have diabetes? The answer is yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so this will become the moral quandary, which is do we want to be organic in our lives, even if being organic in our lives, I'm using organic as just a, a word for normal mm -hmm. or historically normal, mm -hmm. or do we want to try to, you know, optimize? And you get into a really, like, um, eugenics-type argument, I guess, um, where we're optimizing for what? And who gets to choose what we're optimizing mm -hmm. for? And what are the rules of optimization? What if a country like Russia decides we're just going to, all of our generations are going to be, you know, 10 foot tall people. We're going to optimize for making everybody the size of the guy from uh, Game of Thrones, the mountain. <laughs> right? You could do that. You could create a super race. Uh, well, I don't know how, I mean, it's, this is where engineering, where the borders biology and engineering, you know, I mean, biology is not an engineering discipline yet. So you have right. no idea what you're getting. I mean, you're mucking around in, in, in things that, like, you don't necessarily have clear understanding of yet, you know, and so. There are people, there are players on the global stage mm -hmm. who have access to the same technology you do, who might not have the same ethical or moral bearing, correct? Mm -hmm. We have a group of people living on this planet who are living in the religious age. There is a percentage of Christians and Muslims who believe that we should read sacred texts, you know, literally, mm -hmm. whether that means chopping people off or, you know, caning people or killing the apostates. Mm -hmm. Like, this technology is in the hands of those people as well. It's not limited to just the smart, bright kids from MIT and Berkeley, is it? Uh, well, so, yeah, bios, this is biosafety. These issues do come up, I mean, in synthetic biology specifically. But these have also been sort of addressed with more primitive sort of genetic engineering, you know, uh, that, that came online in, in the 80s and so, so, so forth. So basically... How was it addressed back then? Um, so, I mean, I think you can't really lock this technology down. So no. the idea is basically, um, you know, kind of like, I think, careful observation. So the FBI does go do a lot of outreach to community labs um, that are out mm. there now. There's a lot of community labs, um, you know, here in here in New York and, and Seattle, um, like Hive Bio up in Seattle. So um, there's usually this outreach component to make sure that, it, that things are being taught, you know, ethics are being taught, and that there's protocols in place to make sure what people are doing are, is, are, are being done in a, in a way that, you know, conforms to the rules. Um, there's also, I think, a movement towards this sort of robotic uh, laboratory ah. in the cloud. So maybe a lot of these experiences will be done like on a computer and then actually done in a secure facility somewhere in the cloud. And you may see the results, but you may not actually get access to them. And so therefore you can maybe control that better in that manner too. So that's fascinating. The, our government is aware of the dangers here, mm -hmm. just like they were with bioweapons, just like they were with nuclear weapons and the Manhattan Project, et cetera. So they're literally keeping tabs on this. Yeah, I think they're, they're, they definitely are aware of the potential uh, for its use and misuse. And I think they want to make sure that, you know, that to the best they, they can without quashing or stifling innovation, that there's processes and procedures in place to monitor its development. It's wild. I wonder if this is what the next, like, big wave of terrorism and or wars and, you know, global uh, insecurity will be based upon. Mm, I hope not. I would, I would say drones would be more of a terroristic threat than a... <laughs> well, appara apparently, the way, apparently the way the United States has been using them in some cases has proven this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's kind of sad. We use them pretty indiscriminately to not be at war with people, but to kill c civilians and collateral damage seems to be a secondary thought to us. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know what the truth is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But this means this technology is everywhere. And ki when it, I mean, kids are doing some of this stuff too, right? Kids are out there doing 
This is like, this has reached the high school level. Sure, yeah. There's high school labs where you, you know, do, do DNA manipulation and things like that. So It's wild. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a very interesting future. Did you, th how long have you been working in this field? Uh, so I started off in computer science, actually, and huh. then I went back to grad school for uh, genetic epidemiology, which is sort of like biostatistics. And mm. so I, I tried to leverage my way into biology through what I knew already, which was computers. So These are the people who are actually making the changes, the people who have CS degrees and then go into biology or have dual degrees, because you really need to be able to write code in order to do this effectively. Or code is becoming much more of a requirement now. I mean, the, the, a lot of data is generated um, from experiments now, especially sequencing and things like that. You have you know, all these base pairs, you know, millions, billions of things you're looking at. Uh, you want to find correlations. You, you brought up our artificial intelligence at the beginning of the program. That's coming into play now, um, you know. And so, yeah, so it definitely helps. It's becoming a data-driven science uh, in biology. And so definitely being able to code uh, helps. So when you got into this, whatever, five or 10 years ago, when mm -hmm. did you get into it, 10 years ago? Uh, I was journey? always fascinated with codes in general. So obviously yeah. computers would be the natural first stop. Right, but with the biology stuff, yeah. 10 years ago? Uh, so ten. biology, yeah, I guess it would be uh, actually 10 years ago now, yeah. What you've seen in the last 10 years, how are you, where did you think we would be 10 years later than when you started? You think we're further ahead than you anticipated, further behind, or exactly where you thought we'd be? I guess I'm kind of an optimist, so I guess I thought we'd be further ahead a little bit. You did? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I, also, I didn't realize just how complex biology is in some regards. I mean, you're like, oh, we can just apply these algorithms to this data, and we'll find something. Well, no, there's, mm. there's, you're, you're doing so many comparisons. You're going to find spurious results. Uh, things are not clear. There's not... Mm. these. Things are necessarily not linear. There's a lot of nonlinearity to things, so it's 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 much more difficult. And also, when I was doing some some of the research I was doing back then, um, you know, there was this kind of common, common, uh, common variant, common disease hypothesis where most of the diseases people thought were like you you have this, either have this mutation or you don't have this mutation. Some part of the population has the mutation, some part doesn't. The part that has it has the disease. The part that doesn't is healthy. But it, it's turned out that in a lot of cases you have like maybe just a very specific mutation that maybe only you have, but it mm. gives rise to a disease that everybody that has a general name, you know, or they call it X. So there may be five people who have X, but they all have different mutations. So statistically, mm. you can't really determine what's causing it. You'd have to have a very huge sample size that's, you know, prohibitively expensive to gather and, 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 and analyze. So, um, so there's limitations to, you know, yeah. to, to artificial intelligence or machine learning or statistics to find these things sometimes. I mean, it's just the way things are. It's wild. It's wild. I wonder how long we're going to live for. <laughs> I really like, you know, just if we continue at this pace, you know, somebody was telling me that they think the pace of science right now is that we're adding a month to people's lifespans every year. So high quality month? I think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I think they, they think like, you know, in 30 years, we'll have added three years to lifespan or something. It makes mm -hmm. reasonable sense to me. Other people think it's two or three months are being added a year. That seems unreasonable to me. Mm -hmm. But if we start adding a year to lifespan every year, that's, pretty incredible. that's a pretty incredible point. Yeah. I don't know how many gains there are, but it does seem like living past 100 is going to be something that our children or our children's children are going to be able to do pretty easily. I would, yeah, I would just suspect, I mean, you know, there's, I think the biggest the biggest thing that increased lifespan, I think, was basically clean water. So, and then there's been sort of yeah some marginal improvements since then. Uh, but now there possibly there could be another big jump like that. Just look what know. we did with cancer. I mean, yeah. just the ability to mitigate cancer from spreading or mm -hmm. detecting cancer so that we can mitigate it from spreading mm -hmm. has created so many survivors. I mean, just the death sentence for cancer has largely gone away. It's not if you get it early, it's a very manageable situation. Mm -hmm. Just 30, 40 years ago, it wasn't. It was a, yeah, it was a horrible thing, yeah. It was a death sentence. Yeah. I mean, you, you, prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, like any of these cancers, throat cancer, you were gone. Just, can't, you know, say goodbye. Mm -hmm. it's just, it was a matter of how long the goodbye was. Now, if we catch it early, we can eradicate it or marginalize it. And then, we're, I mean, what, what can we do with synthetic biology to deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be incredible. Huge. Wild. You're in the right place at the right time. <laughs> Is this like the old, there's a first synthetic biology incubator, and is this the first time they're having the synthetic biology conference here in San Francisco? Or no, the second? so the conference has been going on, um, let's see, I think it's maybe three years old now. I got to um, go to this thing, man. You, you, you gotta, yeah, if you, I, I can yeah, hook me get up. you, I can hook you hook up, yeah. Up. I want to go <laughs> to this in the next couple of days. This yeah, is yeah, mind-blowing. Yeah, uh, probably, Wednesday will probably be the big thing, but uh, there's a lot of great speakers. Esther Dyson will be there. Oh, cool. Uh, I love Sam Esther. Altman will be there. Awesome. Yeah, so it's Yeah, I'm going to come by and crash this thing. Yeah. All right, listen. 
Matthew Marcus. I'm gonna cla- I'm gonna look at me. I'm gonna crash a synthetic biology conference. This, uh, maybe this is why I moved to San Francisco. <laughs> it's like, yeah, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm gonna crash a synthetic biology conference. F it. Yeah. I'll crash that. All right. You I'm gonna need, go to the no after party. There's no need to crash it. I'm sure you'll be open. I want to go to the <laughs> after party. What's the after party like? I that's know you, yeah. that you guys must get crazy. Yep, that's right. I can't imagine what you guys are making for the after party. There must be some last, pretty great stuff going down at the after party. Last year, the after party was actually at Cambrian Genomics. Was it really? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, hmm. that's sad. Yeah. I miss that guy, Austin. He's, he, he was, was great. He was, I mean, you know, I get to interview a lot of people on the show, and I really, like, I, I felt like I wanted to talk to him forever. I very rarely get that with the person. I like, mm-hmm. listen, all due respect, like, this is a great conversation. Mm-hmm. I could go another hour. Mm-hmm. But after that, I'd let you get back to work. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But with him, it was just one of these things where he, as, the, as the, we got to the second hour, we did like a two or three hour interview. But as we got to the second hour, it started to get more interesting mm-hmm. because he started his, uh, the way his mind was working, he just kept, you know, getting more and more amped up about what could possibly be done. And his mind was just a beautiful thing. He had no barriers, you know. <laughs> so that, no, so, yeah. no, yeah. I mean, this is one of the things about people who suffer from whatever he, I don't know the uh, exact diagnosis he had. I've only what, heard from what his family has said to me or other people publicly. But, you know, it's one of the things about mental illness in our field is, you know, a lot of times either mental illness or challenges that you have or things that make us unique in our mental makeup. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether you define them as mental illness or superpowers is, you know, some people have Asperger's. It gives them the ability to have incredible focus. Some people are bipolar. It gives them the ability to hit peaks that uh, normal people can't hit. Mm-hmm. Of course, they hit low notes too, which is, you know, apparently what happened here. But, you know, sometimes those people who can hit those peaks, that manic peak, you know, they can show us that like, hey, there's something up here worth checking out, you know? That's correct. Yeah. So anyway, Austin, we miss you. Uh, and to his family, uh, you know, we're very sorry for your loss, but this was a person who was a very bright star. And as you can see, people in the industry still think about him. And there's a little bit of a legacy here, hopefully. Um, all right, listen, Matthew Marcus of Pembient, what a great guest. And uh, I'll see you at the Synthetic Biology After Party. Thanks to everybody. And Jackie, thanks to surprising me with a great guest today. All right, we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.